at the children's moment asking some questions. How many of you like to hang out with complainers? Not one hand. Oh, one hand from one smart aleck in the group. It's hard to imagine that there's only one smart aleck in this group. We don't like to hang out with complainers. Why don't we like to hang out with complainers? Tell me why. Downer. Negative. What's that? Sick. I'll let you talk to her about that. It's not that I don't agree. I think it's because complainers kill joy. Want, want to make an un, if you ever wanted to make a happy room miserable, you only have to do one thing. Walk in and start complaining. Because as soon as one person starts complaining, what happens? Another person and another person and another person and another person begin complaining. It's true, isn't it? It's contagious. And it's viral. Complaining kills our joy. It makes us unhappy. And when, quite frankly, the person next to you is unhappy, that generally makes you unhappy too, doesn't it? So what do we do? What do we do on this journey of life towards joy about the complainers and the whiners and, and those who want to break us down? Well, I think there are some things, and I think they're very scriptural things, and, and I think Paul talks about them. On, and, and I'm going to tell you how to conquer complaining or complainers or whiners. You ever notice it doesn't tell anyone, doesn't do anyone any good to tell the complainer to stop complaining? Because they put it this way. Well, I'm only telling you how I feel. <laughs> and it's going to be worse tomorrow. It's true, isn't it? Well, I would tell you how many things there are you can do to to combat complaining, but you already know. How many things are there? Five? Turn to a neighbor and say, he's right, there's five. Thank you. I'm going to tell you that the first thing we can do is the first thing we can do anytime we find out there's a problem, and that's admit it. How many of you like to admit that you have problems? Yeah. Almost as many people who like to be around complainers. The same three hands went up, I think. If we're constant complainers, if we suffer from the disease of complaint-itis, it's a new word, we need to admit that there's a problem. Proverbs, the, the 28th chapter says this in verse 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. And I'm going to tell you that I think being a complainer is a sin. Being filled with complaints all the time is a sin. Because you're hurting not only yourself, you're hurting people. So we need to admit that we have a problem. We need to admit it and we need to ask for forgiveness now, some of you are going, he's not preaching to me this morning. I never complain, right? Um, if you're thinking that, ask the person sitting next to you. <laughs> we just want to double check because maybe you never complain. And if you never complain, you need to talk with Glenn after worship because we have a job for you. <laughs> he doesn't know that yet. Ask yourself some questions this week. How much time do I spend complaining, griping, arguing? How many times will I say, life is rotten? Because here's what we know. If you spend the majority 
amount of your time verbalizing the negative, you have a problem. In the verse from Proverbs, it tells us that we're worth a lot. You see, in, in, in one of the lines that I have here, we, we need to remember that how we speak is how we think. So if we speak complaining all the time, if we are arguing all the time, if we are unhappy all the time, then maybe we're thinking something's wrong with you and I or with ourselves. So we need to admit that we have a problem because problems, until they're admitted, never go away. Now the second thing we need to do is not only admit it, we need to start doing some better self-talk. How many of you ever talk to yourselves? I was going to say, if Steve doesn't raise his hand, I've heard him talking to himself. The fact is, we all talk to ourselves. Sometimes we're just louder than others. Because, I don't know if you know it or not, but we, we, we talk to ourselves in our thinking process. That's how we think. We think in language. So how do you talk to yourself? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, look at first how you talk to other people. Then ask yourself, do I sound like that? If we really want to move to having more joy on our journey, we need to begin speaking more joy on our journey. It's like my friend Christy, who, who I said complains a lot. And she says, I complain when it's raining and when it's suggested that that's good to help things grow. She says, Yes, and then the sun will come out and it will burn me. How do we talk about the things that are happening around us? I had another one of those weeks where talk was really a trying thing. I actually had to spend some time on the phone with some customer service people <laughs> who weren't very interested in providing customer service. And I'm writing the sermon at the same time as I'm on hold and on the line. Two days in a row with this particular company, I was on the phone for an hour and 13 minutes. I don't know how they do that. Two days in a row, an hour and 13 minutes, exactly. Somebody should have been saying, David, why are you bothering? I was bothering because I was told to. just telling it like it is. We resolved the problem finally yesterday. A very nice technician came to our home. He grumbled about the problem I was having. He took pictures of the problem I was having. And he said, you'll hear from us on Tuesday because you're not paying for this. And I went, yes! <laughs> I was really nice to this technician. How do we talk to people? How do we talk to ourselves? Do we start out our conversations with ourselves saying how worthless we are or how blessed we are? Do we start our time of prayer and effort recognizing our sinfulness but giving thanks for our grace-filled forgiveness? Or do we never see the forgiveness? Paul tells us also in the book of Philippians, you know, 
whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure. Think on these things. Focus on the good. Look for the good. See the good. And then speak the good. I'm always amazed every time I think about God as creator. In that first book of the Bible, Genesis, when God creates the heavens and the earth, he speaks them into existence. He said, let there be. And he ends each phrase or each section saying, and it was good. It was good. until he gets to the day he creates us. That leaves lots of options, doesn't it? But not for God. He gets to the end of his creative stance and he looks at what he has made and he changes his words from it was good it is very good. So folks, change your talk because God created you good. God created you in God's image. God gave you all of the gifts and talents and skills that God knew you would need for living life. So change the way we talk, especially about ourselves. Speak positively is the third thing. I wonder what would happen if we practiced as a church only saying positive things for a week. First of all, we'd have to hire some positivity police. Because people would say, I want to be positive, but. But don't you think our world would change if, if everything we said was positive? If when we looked around the room to the, to the people who disagree with us, we said, gosh, I love that they disagree with us? Would it change the way we think? I think it would. I always loved the creation story. You know this. Adam and Eve were in the garden. And you know what happened. Adam ate the wrong fruit. And it was downhill from there. God came to him in the garden and said, what did you do? And Adam did, said, the only thing that could come to his mind, she made me do it. <laughs> and every man, when they read that, go, yes! And Eve, not to be outdone by Adam, says, but the creature you created, God, that snake in the grass over there, made me do it. And the women go, yes. And God says, no. God says, you chose. You disobeyed. You turned from the good. You see, we love to blame people for the bad stuff that happens around us. We blame the cooks in our restaurants, and we blame, you know, the people who ask us to do things, and we blame our spouses. We blame our children. Here's how it goes. If only I didn't have all those kids, I'd have money. 
It's true, <laughs> but it's a complaint. And very few people I know would ever trade their children for money. But how do we talk? We know that our children pick up really quickly how we talk. If we speak positively, our children speak positively. If we speak negatively, they speak negatively. So watch what we say. You know, When we get right down to it, I told you there were five, but I'm going to quit here. When it gets right down to it, finding joy on the journey really only requires one thing. Only one. And that's for each one of us to make a decision. To decide. To decide that we're going to speak positive words. We're going to think positive things. We're going to live positive lives. And here's what's going to happen. I love to go to big kinds of events where there are lots of people and, and I generally start at the back of the room and I watch For about 15 minutes, I just watch the room. And I decide where I want to sit by what I see in the room. Because you know what happens in big rooms where there's lots of people? People congregate around positive people. People congregate around people who are encouraging and uplifting. People congregate around people who don't complain all the time but have solutions. People congregate around those who give off joy in the journey. And because that's where I want to be, that's who I go sit by. I can see it happening already. Next week, you're all going to congregate in the back of the room to see who's happy. <laughs> I dare you. We're going to sit next to John, aren't we? Perfect. <laughs> Folks, we're all going on a cruise. John's buying. <laughs> When we focus on the positive things that life has for us, when we change our attitudes from bad to good, when we let the words that come out of our mouth be words of encouragement and hope instead of conflict and depression, our lives change. And when we do all this in the name of Jesus, When we do all this in the name of Jesus, not only will our lives change, but the lives of those who live around us and who serve with us will change. And all of God's people said,